Great. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Geobiology and Geomicrobiology Seminar Series at Bristol University. For those who are joining for the first time, um, this is an effort between the schools of Geographical Sciences and Earth Sciences. I'm the, ho the, the host today. Uh, my name is Patricia Sanchez Baracaldo from uh, Geography and my co-host is Casey Bryce from Earth Sciences. Um, it's a real pressure to have Kurt Kohnhauser today. Um, I was sort of really excited that he agreed to give a talk. Um, he really doesn't need an introduction. Um, in fact, we could be like here for 10 minutes going over you know, his amazing career. Um, but just to sort of give a brief introduction, Kurt studied geology at the University of Toronto. Uh, then he did his PhD at the University of Western Ontario. Um, and he's done work in, uh, the, in the USA, in uh, the UK. He was at Leeds, in the, I think in the, in the States. He was um, in Pennsylvania State University. And then he settled in um, the, the University of Alberta um, in 2002, um, where he is in the Department of Earth Sciences and Atmospheric Sciences. Um, in terms of awards, he's got lots of awards and lots of very impressive awards. Um, I count 13 in his website. Um, but um, from, I guess, sort of some of the prestigious ones. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, uh, and most recently he received an award um, um, for the Geobiology and Geomicrobiology um, Distinguished Career um, by the Geological Society of America. So over to you, Kurt. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to give a talk, and especially for waking up so early for us. Um, you're welcome. Well, thanks Patricia and Casey for, for the kind invite. So this is going to be my first ever Zoom departmental seminar. And in fact, it's probably been a year since I've actually done a departmental seminar. So I apologize in advance that this is going to sound more like a lecture because that seems to be all I do these days. So what I'd like to do really briefly is talk about some of the research that I'm currently doing in terms of looking at nutrient supply from land to the oceans and ultimately how it gets buried into rock record. So this is work I started about two years ago, but we kind of got sidetracked with the COVID for obvious reasons. So some of the field work we wanted to do, like in Rio Tinto, um, some of the work I'm going to talk about in Russia, we couldn't do. Also, my lab was closed for about four months, so we couldn't do any of that either. But anyways, we are picking up the pieces and getting things done. And so the reason I wanted to talk about this material today is because I got quite a few grad students all working on various topics of it. So it's a nice synthesis for the things we do. So many of you have probably seen this slide before. It's uh, from Lines All 2004. And what it shows is the evolution of oxygen on Earth. And there's two parts to this. The first part in the red is the classic model worked on by people like Dick Holland and Jim Castings that shows in the Archean very low oxygen concentrations in the atmosphere. Then it ramps up on something called the Great Oxidation Event. Then we get a second increase during the Neoproterozoic. So we get two increases in oxygen. This first one's called the Great Oxidation Event. This is the Neoproterozoic Oxidation Event. Now the line is drawn here at about 2.3 billion years ago because that's what we used to think the GOE was based on things like the record of red beds or paleosols or the fact that we still have the presence of detrital uraninite and pyrite in sediments up to 2.3 and after that we don't, which means it's been oxidized. However, in the last two decades, what's happened is we've kind of added some nuance to this figure. For example, we now kind of realize that the GOE probably started more like 2.5 billion years ago. The, the smoking gun really for oxygenation of the atmosphere is the sulfur MIF record. And we see a loss of the sulfur MIF record beginning at 2.5. And why that's a trigger for oxygen is basically that to get the sulfur MIF record, you need to have photooxidation of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere. That only works in the absence of an ozone screen. So as soon as you get ozone, you can no longer get the photooxidation. So you no longer get the MIF record. So we've got that pushed back to 
Then we've also got what we think is called, well, well this is based on Andre Becker's term, an oxygen overshoot, where oxygen levels may have approached near modern levels around 2.2 billion years ago. And then what becomes interesting is that not only does oxygen increase, but it decreases quite a bit. Now, there's a lot of debate over what happens in the so-called boring billion and just how low does it go. But the argument is that it could have dropped all the way back down to 10 to negative 4, so only about an order of magnitude more than the Archean. And then it picks up to the Phanerozoic levels. Then there's these issues called whiffs. So there's an argument first proposed by Ariel Anbar that there were periodic times when the atmosphere became oxygenated, but these are short-lived events. Now, some people buy into the whiffs. I, I really don't. I instead believe in something called benthic mat model where we have cyanobacterial mats growing on land. They produce oxygen. They give you the oxidative features that you didn't pick up in a rock record. So I would argue that we have oxygen on Earth, probably before 3 billion years old, but associated with microbial mats. It's not an atmospheric story, which the whiff story is. So this is, so much of my work has been done on this part of the, of the Earth's history, looking at the great oxidation event and looking at evidence for oxygenation of the rock record. But I've moved kind of over towards this area here in the green. And that area in the green represents this thing called the Loma Gundi event. So this is a blow up um, <clears throat> taken from Andre Becker's paper. And the Loma Gundi event is about a 160 million year old event that starts roughly around 2.2 billion years ago and ends about 2.06. And what it's characterized by is this enormously large positive excursion in the carbonate isotope record. In other words, the limestones have a positive fractionation. Prior to that, up to these, these events right here, it's basically zero. So seawater tends to be zero, so limestones tend to be zero. After the Loma Gundi event, it stays zero again. So we have something unusual happening between the GOE, which is a 2.5, and 2.06. And in the stipple, as Andre points out, these are, we see signals for this, but it's poorly constrained. It may be in only one location. Some of them are multiple locations, but the timing's not perfect. So we know something's happening in here, but we're not quite clear what it is. But this is a record that is found on multiple continents, and it appears to be one long-lived event. And just for your information, the blue represent the different glaciations that we have um, in the early Paleoproterozoic. So I'm interested now <clears throat> in what my talk's going to be, is what gets us into this. And how does it ultimately relate to the great oxidation event, which happened over here? So I'm just going to start off with a paper that when it first came out, I wasn't very keen on. In fact, I, it, it kind of prompted me to write another paper, a paper you know, following this one. Um, and the reason I didn't really like it is because I had an issue with not so much how they did the work, but their interpretation. And what I'm basically going to get to is, what this work from Robbie Fry is, is he looked at the chromium isotope record in banded ion formations. That's these chemical sediments, this is a picture in the background, of these laminated rocks, basically banded in iron and chert. And he looked at various banded ion formations through time and measured chromium isotopes. And in short, when you see a positive fractionation, that tells you that there was an oxidative event. Okay? So crustal values around zero, whenever you get a positive, the argument is that oxygenation. And here's how the model actually works. So you start off with chromium-3 in a rock like chromite, which you find in ultramafic mafic, um, rocks. So you have the mineral chromite, or it can be just simply a residual phase stuck in soils because chromium is pretty hard to dissolve. To oxidize chromium-3 to chromium-6, it's not actually an oxygenation story, but it's actually a manganese story. And it works like this. To oxidize chromium-3, you need manganese-4. Manganese-4 oxidizes chromium-3 to chromium-6, leaving you manganese-2. That chromium-6 is mobile. Chromium-3 tends to be immobile. Chromium-6 is mobile. So that you have your chromate anion then moves to the ocean. The reason it is in, in some way an oxygenation story is you need oxygen to oxidize the manganese-2 to give you the manganese-4 in the first place. So although the oxidation of chromium-3 to chromium-6 isn't directly an oxygen story because it goes through a manganese intermediate, it is indirectly related to oxygen because you need to oxidize the manganese too. Yeah? 
So there is an O2 story of this. So we have atmospheric oxygen, forms manganese 4, which reacts with chromium 3, gives us chromate. This, this oxidation step gives you a positive fractionation all the way up to plus 7. So you get a positive, positive chromate entering in the ocean. Now, once it gets into the ocean, it gets instantaneously re-reduced back to chromium-3 by ferrous iron. Now, we know the oceans during the Archean and Paleoprozoic were what we call ferruginous, iron-rich. We know that because we've got this big, vast record of band iron formations. So the chromium-6 quantitatively gets reduced by iron-2 to form a chromium-3 iron-3 hydroxide. Because it's quantitative, it retains the isotopic fractionation of the chromate, which was positive. In other words, when you measure a BIF and you get a chromium isotopic fractionation that's positive, it tells you you went through this cycle, which ultimately is linked to O2. All right? So that's his basic model. And what he suggested is that you started getting oxidation already around 2.8 billion years ago. So this in itself is pretty interesting, right? Because we, at this point in time, this was back in 2009, prior to that, the GOE was still around 2.4. Errol Anbar had published his paper about the whiff of oxygen at 2.5. Suddenly we're pushing oxygen 300 million years back in time. So, and then what he records is we get a decrease and then we increase again. So, there's a couple of reasons why this was a paper for nature. One is, as I said, it pushes back the timing of O2, but second, it showed a decrease. Now, to be fair, the decrease is here because there aren't a lot of banded ion formations between 2.4 and 2.1. Basically, there's just too much oxygen around at that time for the iron to get upwelled onto the shelf. That's where you get banded ion formations. So we had lots of O2, so there is a very sparse BIF record, which is the blank. But where I had a problem with is a couple things. One is showing a trend line between here and here when there is no data here. It's a bit cheeky. So we don't really know what's happening here. But another problem I had with this is the fractionation. Is it's minimal fractionation. You can see it goes all the way up to plus three. By the time we get to near perozoic, it's all the way up to almost five. At a time when there's limited amount of oxygen, we would not expect quantitative oxidation. So if we get non-quantitative oxidation, we'd expect a maximum fractionation factor. Remember that's about seven, and we don't see that. And the biggest problem I had with the story ultimately was the type of rocks that he looked at. So there's different kinds of iron formations. There is what we call superior type. These are the ones that form on the continental shelf. And then there's those called algoma type. These form in submarine hydrothermal systems, like a submarine vent. The BIF that they use for these numbers all come from the algoma type, the submarine vent. So my argument was, is that how can you use something that formed under the ocean as a proxy for continental weathering? But nonetheless, what Robbie showed is that there was a decline. And in fact, he's kind of right about that. We do recognize that there was a decline in O2 later on. We see that with other types of proxies, but he was the first one really to record that. So being intrigued by the chromium record, we decided to look at the chromium concentration in ion formations. So we don't do isotopes in our lab. Instead, what we did is we looked at the actual concentrations. And the different colors represent different kinds of ion formations that really are neither here nor there. We normalize the titanium. So this is continental crust. The reason we do that is because we want to see what comes in as a detrital particle, like you know, a grain being washed in by a river, versus an orthogenic enrichment. In other words, it came in in solution. So that's why we normalize the titanium. And what one sees with the chromium record is that you start to ramp up about 2.48, and then you peak at 2.32, and then it drops. But why that's interesting is that if you believed in the, the Fry story about the chromium and the BIF coming in as chromate, then one would expect that the chromium should stay high later on, because once we start getting oxygenation, we should continuously be oxidizing our chromium-3. But we don't. We see something unique happening here that we don't see ever again. And so we also use this 2.48 to kind of pinpoint at the time. So this was the oldest at two, 2000, 2011 when we wrote this paper. That was the furthest we had pushed the GOE back. So 2.48. It's now about 2.45. I only mention that because remember I said the original GOE model had it starting at 2.3. So we looked at chromium enrichment and we see something distinctly happening between 2.5 and 2.3. 
We also had looked at the shale record. So I should mention the iron formation records typically measures what's in seawater, okay, because it's a chemical precipitate. When you're looking at shales, you tend to look at what's coming in is, is clastic material, right? So what we find with the clastic input is we see once again, high chromium input between the GOE and two billion years, and it drops. These orange ones are new ones that we've been recovering from the far deep database. These are from drill cores drilled up in, um, in Northwestern Russia. So once again, the shell record is showing something unusual in the Precambrian at this point that you don't see again. So in fact, whatever is happening post GOE, but during the Loma Gundi is real. It's, and it's being recorded in the rock record. So if you believe in what the Fry model had, we for sure have chromium coming into the ocean, right? Because we see it in our BIF, we see it in our shales. This is just a speciation diagram of chromium and everything above this line here is chromium six. So this is the oxidized version. This is chromium three, this is the reduced version. Now chromium three is pretty insoluble. That's why chromium three tends to build up in soils because it's hard to get into solution. You need a pretty oxic conditions to do it. But you can mobilize chromium-3 under acidic conditions. And what this figure essentially shows, it shows a variety of different chromium-3 species and as they vary over pH. But the take home message here is that, let's say you take a look at the top line here, which is the total amount of chromium-3 in solution. As you go from pH seven all the way to pH four, within those three pH units, you go from about up here, you go at one, two, four, six, you'd go about six orders of magnitude more chromium. In other words, as we decrease the pH, we significantly increase the amount of chromium-3 in solution, and that even exists today. So even in a fully oxic system, rivers today have high chromium-3 if they're slightly acidic. So if we take the chromium in banded ion formations as being a real record, and it is because these are measured values, we have only two options for how we got chromium there. It's either chromium-6 and it's an O2 story, or it's chromium-3 and it's an acid story. As you can probably tell, I'm not buying into the chromium-6 story, I'm gonna buy into the chromium-3 story. So the question is, how do I get the chromium-3 into solution? And this is a perfect example. This is just a modern um, acid mine drainage pond. This is from Greece, oh, sorry, from Cyprus. Um, you guys being in, in Bristol aren't far removed from the, the coal fields in South Wales. I just put this up, I was, I was looking for a picture of acid mine drainage and I came across this one. This was my first ever PhD student, um, but never finished. And I'm assuming probably wasn't happy doing a PhD work, sludging her way through all the muck and the acid. Probably ran out of clothes, I should think. But anyways, so, you know, this is something you can see for yourself. The reason we get the acid drainage there is because of pyroxidation. So really briefly, this is just a figure that shows the rates of reaction varying with pH. And it's about pyrite oxidation. So there's four different reactions here. Looking at reaction number two, which starts it all off. So if you take pyrite, which is a mineral which forms under reduced conditions, and you expose it to atmospheric conditions, to rain and to water, what happens is it dissolves. Now you've got ferrous iron here, and you've got sulfide here. So both of these components are reduced. As it dissolves, the sulfide gets oxidized all the way to sulfate, produces a bit of acid. So this is the initiator reactor for acid mine drainage. Then in reaction number three, the ferrous iron then gets oxidized, forming ferric iron. Now, the reason this reaction accelerates at a pH above 4.5 is because if you put ferric iron solution at a pH above 4.5, it spontaneously hydrolyzes. In other words, it reacts with water and forms ferrihydrite. So that then forms ferrihydrite, which means you we basically have to drive the reaction from left to right because we're losing Fe3 as a solid phase. But the key point here is that at pH less than 4.5, ferric iron is soluble. In other words, you can keep ferric iron in solution if it's high pH, or sorry, high acidity. Why that's important is when you take a look at the overall reaction for acid mine drainage. We started off with oxidizing with O2, but that's pretty slow. The fast way to oxidize pyrite is actually with ferric iron. But remember, ferric iron is only soluble under acidic conditions. So when it's under acidic conditions, ferric iron acts on pyrite, oxidizes it, forms ferrous iron and sulfate and 16 protons. This is the big acid generating step.
But here's our problem. This reaction, which is taking place up here, is four orders of magnitude faster than reaction three. And why that's important is because it consumes ferric iron four times, four orders of magnitude faster than ferric iron can be generated down here. In other words, acid mine drainage should just stop. We should never actually get acid mine drainage because you can't generate the ferric iron fast enough. But we do, right? And the reason we do is because we have biology that basically drives reaction number three. So we have chemoautotrophic microbes that facilitate this reaction and they push the rate up to here. Why that's important is here's the mechanism for how we can get chromium-3 into the oceans. We simply oxidize pyrite on land, drop the pH, and it mobilizes the chromium. So in our paper, what we basically argued for is that that chromium flux at 2.48 must indicate the evolution of oxic or chemo, aerobic chemolithic autotrophs, such as iron sulfide oxidizing bacteria on land. So we call this the first evidence for basically rock drainage or earth first rock drainage around 2.48. So essentially what we're saying is that we get all this pipe. So imagine this, we have an environment that up to about the GOE has been, there's been a reduced atmosphere, right? So there's lots of CO2, there might have been, there would have been methane as well, but there's no O2, which means pyrite is sitting at the surface of the earth unoxidized. Now oxygen is in the atmosphere. The chemolithoautotrophic bacteria take over, take off. They start oxidizing all that pyrite that's been sitting there for hundreds of millions of years. So we have this vast reservoir of pyrite that's been untapped until now. Now that pyrite gets oxidized. We drop the pH solution in, in terms of soil water and in groundwater. So we have acidic, basically, waters draining from the land into the oceans. That's why I kind of look for this really barren landscape. I'm trying to picture an environment that looks completely weathered away. Remember, there's no plants back at this point in time. The only thing we had is microbial mats on land. So we've completely oxidized our land. So in this figure, I've got chromium being supplied to the oceans is chromium-3, <coughs> one of these species. Or, to be fair, it can also be absorbed onto clay particles or organic compounds. Where it hits the ocean, it instantly precipitates. That chromium-3 then gets included in all those iron formations that we, we measured. The iron formations, I never really went into detail, but a lot of the iron formations we look at are, when we typically, sorry, when we typically look at iron formations, and I talk about the trace elements in, in BIF through time, I tend to look at iron formations that have very low detrital indicators. In other words, very little aluminum, titanium, zirconium. Because I want to basically look at the chemically pure sediments. So BIF are kind of like salt today, it precipitates of the ocean. But with that said, there are some that form closer to shore where there's lots of muds and sediment from land as well. So these are kind of like dirty BIFs. Now we typically don't look at the dirty BIFs when we try to look at seawater composition because we've got obviously the continental contribution. But this particular case with the chromium record, we had no choice because the only BIF that picked up the chromium signal are the ones that were what, we, what I would call dirty. And that's because the chromium can't get very far offshore because remember the chromium is only being mobilized because it's acidic. As soon as you have a pH four river groundwater hitting pH eight ocean, it's all gonna precipitate out. In other words, you can look at iron formation out here and see no chromium because chromium isn't there. The chromium is a detrital indicator to some extent. So that's where we left off of 2011. So the questions I then had from that is, we have unprecedented pyrite oxidation. What's the implication? One, we increase the flux of nutrients to the ocean because it's not only chromium that I'm transporting, it's not only sulfate that I'm transporting, but any other kind of trace metal associated with sulfides, right? Molybdenum, copper, could be anything. Do those trace metals in the ocean then trigger planktonic blooms? If you get lots of plankton blooms, if you get fast sedimentation rates like in the modern, and you bury very quickly, you're going to bury some of your organic carbon, you're going to increase the preservation of organic carbon. The more organic carbon you bury, especially if it comes from cyanobacteria, means your O2 is allowed to rise because it's not being used in aerobic respiration. Does that then cause the Loma Gundy event? And in, in addition to the Loma Gundy event, the high O2, which is reflected by the carbon isotope record. Now, it just occurred to me, one thing I, I completely glossed over, I never mentioned, in the Loma Gundy event, that positive fractionation of plus 10, why that's significant? To get plus 10 in limestone means you have to bury a lot of organic carbon into sediment. 
right? Photosynthesis takes up the carbon-12 into the biomass, leaves carbon-13 in seawater. Yeah? The more biomass you bury, the more carbon-12 you take out, the more enriched in carbon-13 seawater becomes. So to get a plus 10 tells you you have to bury a lot of carbon-12 in the sediment to give you that carbon-13. So sorry, I should have mentioned that right out because that's kind of the point here, is that the Loma Gundy event, that positive fractionation must represent, well, it doesn't must, but the general consensus is, is it represents a time of high organic carbon burial. So if you produce your organic carbon, let's say via cyanobacteria, but then you bury your organic carbon without re-oxidizing it through aerobic respiration, what that means is O2 builds up in the atmosphere. So that's the, that's the link between carbon burial and O2. So not only do we get that, but another thing we also see at this point is massive phosphorite deposits, massive evaporite deposits, because the pyrid oxidation gives you sulfate, you get lots of gypsum at that point in time too. And as I'm gonna show you, we get lots of phosphate weathering as well. That phosphate being sourced from minerals such as apatite, which are also insoluble, but under acidic conditions become solubilized. So again, remember this record at 2.2 to 2.06 is a unique thing. It's a large carbon excursion, tells you you had lots of oxygen, but it also links to an unusual things that we see in terms of the BIF record and the shale record, which precede it, which show you lots of things were mobilized from land. So I love to show this figure to all my students when we talk about primary productivity. So it's essentially just a satellite image looking at chlorophyll levels on land and in the oceans. And in short, the red shows you high chlorophyll, which means high primary productivity. When you look at areas of high primary productivity today, we can look at upwelling zones like off the west coast of South America and Africa, but also where rivers empty into the ocean, because this is where the supply of nutrients are coming. So you look at the Rio Plata, you look at the Amazon, you can find it in, in lakes, which can become eutrophic. Bottom line is if you take a look at a river system, where it enters into the ocean, either an estuary or a delta, is a place where you often get high primary productivity. We know that today, we see that. That should have been the same in the past, right? So where all this sediment is coming into the ocean, we should expect plankton blooms. So sticking now with the phosphate story. So the reason I got interested in phosphate, because once again, we need to explain the Loma Gundi event in terms of why was there so much primary productivity to give us all that organic carbon burial. My speculation from the 2011 paper was is that it was an increased flux of phosphate to the oceans, which arose as a byproduct of pyrite oxidation. So because of pyrite oxidation, we reduce the pH of soil solutions. That helps dissolve chromium, but it also dissolves things like appetite, putting phosphate into solution. So Andre Becker the next year wrote this paper on the oxygen overshoot, also talked about phosphate supply leading to the Loma Gundi. But we kind of all left it at that. And there's other papers that have talked about phosphate supply and primary productivity, but we never talk about the mechanisms. How does the phosphate actually get from land to the sea? Now, they tend to, most people tend to think of it as either being in solution or associated with oxides. So one of my students has been doing a, <clears throat> a compilation of phosphate supply to the oceans. And what you find is that the dissolved phase actually is kind of the minority phase. Most of it is actually carried in suspension, either as POC or particularly organic carbon, iron aluminum oxides or it's clays. Now, the reason I mention this, why it's important is back in the Precambrian where we didn't have land plants, we wouldn't have had much in the way of POC. Iron aluminum oxides, yes, are a major flux today. But the thing is, if we're gonna argue for acid weathering, remember we solubilized the ferric iron so that it could oxidize the pyrite, so we have acidic conditions. We're not gonna maintain in suspension ferric or aluminum oxides. We'll have some, of course, but this won't be a major vector either. In other words, the major vector we likely had at Recambrian was probably clays. Now, clays are an important vector today for phosphate to the oceans. They're just not the major one. But in lieu of the fact that the major one, these oxides didn't necessarily, weren't as abundant then, what about the role of clays? So just very briefly, when we talk about clays, I'm gonna be talking about two different kinds. We've got the three layer clays, such as Mount Morelnite or Illite, and we've got the two layer clays such as Kaolinite. And all clays have two fundamental layers to them. They have what we call the tetrahedral layer. This is where you have a silicon bounded by four oxygens. And then you have an octahedral layer where you typically have aluminum bounded by OH groups, hydroxylines. 
I'll show you this one is even easier to see. Now the difference between the three layer and the two layer is that the three layer clay has two silica tetrahedra bounding the aluminum hydroxide. The kaolinite only has a one to one. So the way these different clays actually bind to form a mineral is you have cation, um, changeable cations or cation bridging between these different layers. And whereas in kaolinite, you have hydrogen bonding between the oxygens and the OH. So that's the way they basically bond. This is a much tighter bond in general than this. Now, in terms of surface charge, now we know clays tend to be inherently negatively charged, and that's for a, a couple reasons. One is that you have on the edges, on the basal sites, you have residual negative charge because each of these oxygens shares between the silicons, right? So it shares one of its electrons here, it shares one of its electrons here. At the outer edge where there is no silicon, we have a net negative charge. So there's that. There's also something called um, substitution. So in other words, you can substitute, for example, in here, the silicon with an aluminum. So if you substitute a plus four with a plus three, you have a residual negative charge of minus one. So there's structural charge differences, which gives you a negative charge, and there's also the edges. And that can be manifested by cations binding either to the outer surfaces or as exchangeable cations or interlayer cations. So we doing a lot of work in my lab looking at clays and looking at their surface reactivity. So I'm just going to present kaolinite. We've done it for all sorts of clays, but this, we'll just stick with the kaolinite story for the moment. When you look at kaolinite, you do a titration curve. So basically what a titration is, is we incrementally add a bit of base and we see how much, uh, how much protons come off. When we look at something like a clay, we find that there's two major sources of negative charge. There's the structural component, that's this top bar, represented by the LA, can be H being the proton. This is caused by the substitution or those edges, right, the unfilled edges. And then there's what we call the amphoteric sites. These are the silica or the aluminum hydroxide sites. And amphoteric, I mean that when you have a, certain things like aluminum oxide or an iron hydroxide, they can take on a range of charge from positive at low pH to negative at high pH. And that's because you get deprotonation. In short, when you do a titration, when you add more base, what happens is things deprotonate. So the clays deprotonate become negatively charged as you increase in pH. But that negative charge comes from two different things. One, the structural charge deprotonating, but this doesn't happen until a higher pH. What that tells you is that those hydrogens that bind to those structural, um, those sites that have a structural charge to it, bind rather strongly. On the other hand, these ones are all based strictly on pH, and these ones are much more easy to change. So in other words, what this line right here shows is what we call a pKa. That's the transition from this charge to this charge. At this pH right here of 4.7, half of those aluminum hydroxide um, ions are an OH+, and the other half are an OH. So half of them act positively, the other half act neutrally. At a pH of about 6.5, we get a second deprotonation step. In other words, half of the OHs are like this. Half of the OH sites are now negative. So we can see we get increasing negative charge, right? And this one, like I said, all the way up to pH 9.7 or something like that before this deprotonates. Why is that important? So if you do experiments where you're looking at what we call sorption isotherms, looking at how much phosphate can bind to a clay, and this, once again, is simply for kaolinite. And we've got <coughs> four different lines here. The green represents clays, kaolinite, that we had at a low pH, a pH 4 in fresh water. The blue is at pH 6 in fresh water. The red is at pH 8, freshwater ionic strength. And the black is at pH 8 in marine ionic strength. What I see from this figure right here is that I can bind the most phosphate to my clay at low pH and the least at high pH. And interesting, interestingly, ionic, uh, ionic strength doesn't seem to have much of a bearing here in terms of kaolin and phosphate. So the lower the pH, the more phosphate I can bind, as we expect, right? Because that's where the clay still, well, actually, I'll get to that in a second, why we have that. So just remember this part, at low pH, we bind the most phosphate. When we then do what we call a pH edge, just to see exactly at what pH things bind at. So it's basically taking one of these lines at a given pH, right, or, or whatever, at, or sorry, at a given concentration and saying, okay, what happens if we vary the pH now? 
And the black dots are the actual experimental results. And what we see at pH three, we have a low amount of phosphate absorbed. By the time we get to pH four, we have almost maximum, and it stays like that and then progressively decreases. So we have high phosphate absorption at low pH, but not as high as we might have thought at the very lowest pH. So something's happening at three versus four. And then these things right here will become more, they'll make more sense in a, in a second. These are just different ways that we can actually model for what sites are the most important. So when we talk, I'll show you what I, what I mean by a monodentate and bidentate site in a second. But why do we see this trend? Well, we have to take into account phosphate speciation. So phosphate deprotonates as well. At very low pH, it's got no charge. It deprotonates after a pH of about two point something. That's the pKa to this species here. Then it has a second deprotonation at about pH of seven to this. At very low pH around three, there's neutrally charged phosphate binding onto a positively charged clay surface. That's why we don't get much binding. We get more absorption come to pH four because suddenly now we've got deprotonated phosphate. We've got an anion binding to these positively charged surfaces. So that's why we get the highest binding around pH four. And the reason phosphate decreases as you go with pH is simply because the clay surface is now negatively charged and the phosphate surfaces are negatively charged. So negative versus negative repel. So that's why we can bind more phosphate at low pH. Why does that, any of this matter? Well, what I'm trying to suggest is we had acid rock drainage right after GOE. So not only are we dropping the pH and creating, you know, because of all the acid, mobilizing chromium and phosphate, but now that we've dissolved phosphate from appetite, that phosphate is going to be very amenable to sorbing onto clay particles, which get washed by rivers into the oceans. So this is going to be our vector for how do we get phosphate from land to sea? It's going to be via clays. And the reason that's important is because the clays have a charge that allows them to bind phosphate at low pH. At high pH, not so much. But at low pH, they can. And just getting back to different ways we can bond it. I don't know how many of you are familiar with what we call outer sphere versus inner sphere complexes. This is just when we talk about the way things bind in terms of strength of binding. Outer sphere bind less strongly than inner sphere. And what we see basically with phosphate is phosphate loves to bind by inner sphere. So of all the different lines we had, this model, the double, bident, double site bidentate, bidentate means two sites for one and double means two different sites. So our amphoteric sites associated with aluminum hydroxides, that's up here, and the structural charge at pH nine, those are the sites that bind all the phosphate. So phosphate binds pretty strongly at low pH because it forms this inner sphere complex. And I just wanna point out that when we're talking about that, you're probably much more familiar with the iron, iron speciation, but iron behaves in the exact same way. So if you take something like ferric hydroxide, ferry hyde, right? At low pH, it's positively charged. At circum neutral pH, it has a variety of charge. It's got positive, negative, and neutral. And at high pH, it behaves negatively charged. This is why iron oxides are such good sponges for almost everything. You can absorb almost anything to an iron oxide, depending on pH, because of the pH variation. And this is something we call the point of zero charge. At pH 8, we have equal amount of charge of positive and negative. So this is really basically the net charge is zero. So for an iron oxide, it's eight. For a clay, it's something down around four. So that's why clays and iron oxides behave differently. And then two last experiments I want to talk about. So this is done by my former PhD student who's now a postdoc with me, Wei Du Hao. And what he did is we did all these different titrations of clays, different phosphate sorption experiments to different clays. We then thought, what happens if you take a clay, you bind phosphate at low pH, and then you increase the pH? So what we basically did is we, we at, at pH 4, we had our clay, we added phosphate to it, and then we basically just buffered that solution, brought it up to pH 8, increased the ionic strength from fresh to, to seawater ionic strength. And what you see is a progressive decrease in the amount of phosphate absorbed onto the clay. In other words, as we take the solution, we pick up more and more phosphate. The take-home story here is phosphate desorbs from the clay. It desorbs, and this makes total sense, right? because at higher pH, the clay surface charge becomes negative. The phosphate is negative. It's going to desorb. Why is this important for my model? If I have a clay coming from land in a pH solution of let's say four, 
So I've got a kaolinite particle forming on land at pH 4. It binds to phosphate, which has been dissolved from appetite. That kaolinite particle then gets carried by the rivers to the ocean, hits pH 8, higher seawater ionic strength, the phosphate comes off. The reason I wanted to demonstrate that is it's one thing to say phosphate gets from land to the oceans, but is it available for the microbes that grow there? And as a comparison there, we did the same thing with aluminum hydroxides with gibbsite and iron oxides, and we show we don't see this decrease. Why? Because aluminum oxides, iron hydroxides are really strong binders of phosphate. And remember, they have a point of zero charge that stays positive up to pH 8. In other words, the iron oxide is going to hold on to its phosphate really strongly. Why that's important is that if it was iron oxides or aluminum oxides transporting phosphate from land to the oceans, they wouldn't re-release the phosphate once they hit the oceans. In fact, that phosphate is essentially gone, and it gets basically buried with the sediment, and it only becomes remobilized if we do iron reduction. So the only way that I can get phosphate from land to the oceans in a form that's soluble or I'm sorry, avail bioavailable is if it attaches on the clay particles because they then desorb once they hit seawater pH. And then the last experiment we wanted to do is actually test this. Can the plankton actually benefit from this? So we grew up some marine cyanobacteria in Cacacus, and we added about five micromolar of phosphate to them in the media. And by the time we get to day six, so we have one culture growing up to day six. Once we get to stationary phase and at day six, we didn't subdivide that, we split that culture into three. We left one as it is. And what you see is it goes through stationary phase and then it starts going through death phase and the numbers just simply drop. Why? That's because they've run out of phosphate, right? They've exhausted all the phosphate they've had. So, you know, all their dead buddies are now sitting at the bottom of the beaker with the phosphate still included with them. We have not added any more phosphate. So that's a, you know, that's a typical growth curve that you would see if we run out of nutrients. But here's what's kind of cool, is we then added at day six to two different experiments, we added clay loaded up with phosphate. We did not add phosphate in solution, we simply added phosphate bound to kaolinite. One with one gram per liter, that's the orange, and the other one with two grams per liter of kaolinite. And what you see is the populations rebound. Why do they rebound? Because the phosphate desorbs off that clay pretty slowly, and that phosphate then becomes bioavailable to the microbes. So this is just our first run at it. I mean, the results couldn't have turned out any better if I tried to make this up, which kind of has me somewhat skeptical because it worked out so beautifully and very seldom do things work out this nicely. But what it shows is that the phosphate on clays can be bioavailable. So run through the last few slides reasonably quickly. So here's the question. If you're back at the Lumagundi event, at the Lumagundi times 2.2 to 2.06, and you've got acid weathering on land, can a river sediment plume carrying things like kaolinite ultimately lead to enhanced primary productivity? Well, we know the answer to that is yes, right? Because we can see it today in the river areas, in estuaries, coastal environments, we have high plankton bloom because of nutrients. But could this cause increased carbon burial during the Lumagundi? Well, it's not just the trace metals that are important, it's also looking at what happens in terms of the particles. So what I should mention is that when we look at the Lumagundi, a lot of those values of the carbon isotopes are associated with the carbonates. That's how we actually pick it up. But we also find at that point in time, the organic rich residue, where all that organic carbon was buried is with the shales. Okay, so the shales take up all the organic carbon, the organic carbon takes up all the carbon-12, leaves residual carbon-13 in the oceans, which then forms the carbonates. This is why you get a shale, an organic-rich shale. You get all this, the parietal sediment, muds and that being carried into the river. Here you got plankton growing there. They get sedimented out with the, with the clay particles. This is why you get organic carbon being buried with shales. So we did some experiments back in, now, when is this, 2017. So one of my former PhD students looking at sedimentation rates of, of synococcus. And this was only done with one gram per liter of, of clays. And just to put it in this perspective, you know, when you look at the trial input component to rivers, it can vary anywhere from 0.1 grams per clay up to like 100 grams per clay, grams per liter. So this was not a very concentrated, a very turbid solution. Nonetheless, Clay particles bind onto the clay, increasing their flocculation rate, 
It also increases their preservation potential because they become completely enshrouded in clays, which means it's much harder for heterotrophs to get at them because the pore throats in the muds are pretty small. We're talking nanometers, which means cells can't get in there. Also, the clay is completely enshrouded. So, and because clay is a fine grain, it's harder for electron acceptors to get down to it. So bottom line is we increase preservation potential of organic carbon when we bury them with shales, hence why we get the organic rich shales. But the way I've got this diagram, this picture shown here, is we've got the river coming into the ocean, and in currents, longshore drift takes the particles this way. If you go the opposite direction, where there is no, long, where there is no sediment coming in, we can have relatively clear waters where we can have carbonates. So if the environment is right, if it's warm enough and shallow enough, you can get carbonate blooms. Here again, here's where the nutrients come into play. So I'm cheating here. I've got a picture off the coast of the UK here where I got coccoliths. But let's imagine we're talking about cyanobacteria and stem. If we get more nutrients into the ocean, which means planktonic blooms, right? Some of those plankton are going to settle out with clay particles, as I showed you. But those that aren't associated with the clay particles can calcify. And the reason they calcify is because they take in bicarbonate from seawater, right? For CO2 source, and they excrete hydroxyl ions. Those excreted hydroxyl ions change the carbon speciation, change the bicarbonate to carbonate, at the same time, these cyanobacteria have sheaths that bind things such as calcium. That carbonate reacts with calcium and you get calcium carbonate precipitation. So some of you have probably heard of whiting events. So this is one way that you can explain a whiting event. It's simply cyanobacteria photosynthesizing, changing the carbon speciation and calcifying. So this is one way that you can get these whiting events. But in our model, it's related to the fact that we have more nutrients coming into the ocean, promoting more plankton blooms. And lastly, something that uh, I, I'm working on with Casey and, and Patricia, looking at banded ion formations. I see that I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go through this figure right here. But uh, once again, I've cheated here. I've taken a picture of a red tide because I'm trying to show a picture of where ferrous iron gets upwelled onto the continental shelf, oxidizes this ferric iron to form band ion formation. Once again, the argument I've made, and I've been working a lot on band ion formation, is that plankton are needed for banded ion formation. Where do those plankton come from? Well, those plankton need nutrients. Those nutrients come from land. Where Patricia and I will disagree on what kind of plankton it is, I would argue that cyanobacteria played a role. Patricia will argue you didn't have planktonic cyanobacteria at that time. So one of us is right. Um, I'm going to defer. No, I won't defer to Patricia. <laughs> but who knows? This is, this is why we're working together, because we see things differently. But you know, between us, maybe we'll sort this out. And really quickly, the last few slides, and I'll be done in two minutes here, is one of the things associated with the Loma Gundi event are these phosphorites. These are phosphate-rich deposits, something like 10% P2O5. And where does the phosphate come from from phosphorites? Well, it comes originally from organic carbon. So you have lots of cells, biomass, bringing in phosphate with them, and then they, they die on mass, and that phosphate gets remobilized. That's one argument. Others have made the argument that it comes in with things such as iron and manganese oxides. So remember, if it wasn't an acidic solution with clays, if they came in with iron oxides, they'd get buried. The phosphate would not get released until you get to the iron reduction zone. That's where you reduce the ferric iron back to ferrous iron, subsequently solubilizing the phosphate. So you get things like carbonate fluorapatite precipitating. This is just an interesting study from, the, from Schultz and Schultz in 2002, where they showed these really funky type of bacteria called biomargarita. And these guys are, these guys are really odd. They're sulfide oxidizing bacteria that use oxygen or nitrate. And essentially what you see here is you've got these nitrate vacuoles and these elemental sulfur grains. So these guys move up and down the sediment pile. They move up, oxidize elemental sulfur with oxygen, gives them energy. They start forming ATP, taking in phosphate, and storing phosphate as pho uh, polyphosphate granules. They also suck up nitrate, which they store, they then move down to the sediment where they go into their, where they oxidize dissolved sulfide using the nitrate to form elemental sulfur, which they then use up here to oxidize. So what, what, they, so what this model basically showed is the way you get phosphate released is when they go anoxic and they run out of terminal electron acceptors, they actually solubilize the polyphosphate to give them energy, which means you get a lot of phosphate release into the pore waters down here. But what I'm getting at is both of these mechanisms eventually lead to a concentration of phosphate, but you only get that concentration of phosphate if you had the biomass. And I'm just basically saying, so the work that we're moving forward is we're looking at things like phosphorites in rocks at that time. This is work by one of my PhD students looking at these rocks from 
from the Loma Gundi event in Russia. I'll just slide over here. Now, yeah, I'm just gonna move on to the very end. Sorry, I, I talked too much here. Is what we're basically doing is we've, so we've done these experiments. We're gonna do more growth experiments with different cyanobacteria to see in fact, what we just saw with the syncococcus, does that hold? We're also doing a lot of work looking not only at phosphic behavior on clays, but other metals. One of the slides I didn't show you is cadmium, which is a cation, behaves in a similar manner to phosphate. It binds at high concentration at low pH and gets released into the ocean at high pH. It has nothing to do with pH there. It has everything to do with ionic strength because as you increase ionic strength, sodium and chloride, that chloride complexes with the cadmium, strips the cadmium off. But there again, if you think about environmental pollution, if you've got clays bringing in cadmium to an estuary, the pH goes up, cadmium comes off. And then we're also doing the things that looking at paleosols. These are the ancient soil horizons to see if we have high weathering during the Loma Gundi event, which is manifest by trace metals being solubilized and brought into the ocean. On land, those sites of weathering, if they still are preserved, we should see evidence of high chemical weathering there. So that's what these paleosols are, ancient soil horizons. And that's kind of the stuff we're doing now as well. And I just want to thank, so this is my former PhD student who's now a prof at Regina, Jamie Robbins. Wade is now a postdoc with me. Krell's doing all the work in Russia. Jason does all the biomass experiments. And Ron is doing all the phosphate in rivers. So thank you and sorry for uh, running on. Now, I told you I would treat this more like a lecture than a, a proper departmental seminar. But anyway, I'm done. Fantastic. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. That was great. Um, yeah, we probably need to talk about some of those cyanobacteria and, you know, which ones are you looking at? for some, some of the experiments. Um, and I mean, just to sort of follow up with that comment that you made um, about the planktonic groups, I think mm -hmm. from the molecular work that has come out is some of those are, um, the, the, the ones that we have today in the oceans, those sort of go back to the end of the Precambrian but, you know, we could have had other things that didn't make it to today's um, sort of, you know, other bacteria that, you know, other planktonic groups that maybe were around in the GOE. I don't know. I mean, the thing is, this, the, this is one of the problems of looking at the biological record. But anyway, um, there is a question for you. Um, can you read now. it from Greg? Which feedback stabilized the acid drainage effects in 2.0 given that we see multiple carbon excursions rather than one big one? Okay, so with these carbon excursions, I can just, let me go all the way back. Sorry if you're getting a headache doing this. All right. So this one we know is fun. These ones are all associated so this Loma Gundi event is, is my acid story. These ones are associated with glaciations. So some of the arguments will be that as you get deglaciation, basically you get all this glacial flower. That's a physical way of bringing in nutrients into the ocean. So that can explain these two guys. But overall, the feedback, so let me see if I'm trying to understand your question. If we have more plankton, we reduce more CO2. We put more O2 into the atmosphere, more O2 in the atmosphere, it gives you a positive feedback because that O2 leads to more chemical weathering, which brings more nutrients into the ocean. So that's one feedback. The negative feedback, I guess, is the CO2 story, right? You're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, ultimately through the chemical weathering, bearing it into all these limestones, which should then drop the temperature, right? And in fact, that's what you saw in terms of the global glaciations, we do see where we have high plankton blooms followed by glaciation. So I would love to speculate, is this, this one glaciation Huronian implicated in that? I don't know. Um, I will, Craig, I will think about this and try and give you a more coherent answer. So if, if you can just actually maybe just email me and I'll try and email you back an answer because I'd have to actually think about that because there is a balance between positive and negative here. So I'm not sure how it actually ultimately wins in the end. But certainly, we bury a lot of organic carbon. We are taking CO2 out and we're fixing it. But that organic carbon ultimately gets oxidized. So that puts the CO2 back. So that should have no net effect. The only time you're going to get a real effect is if you bury that carbon as inorganic, as in carbonates, right? If we bury the carbonates, then that carbon is sunk down there. 
that should drive out the CO2. So that should reduce the CO2 levels. But I've not thought about on balance how both of those things in competition work. So, so sorry, Craig, that was a, a, a terrible answer. Any but I will, I will say I, I, I got up way earlier than I normally get up and I'm still on my first cup of coffee. So I'm yeah. a bit fit right now. We can excuse you for that. <laughs> um, any more questions? No, no question. I had one if I can jump in here. Yeah, of course. Um, so the kind of acid weathering that you were talking about at the Loma Gundy event, Kurt, is, is that something that's kind of unprecedented in Earth history or do you see similar kind of magnitude of events later or earlier? Unprecedented. Because this, is, this really drives home this model right here. Why do we see so much chromium at this point in time and never again? Yeah. And it's because it's a one-off. Because prior to this, right, there was no O2 in the atmosphere. So all the pyrite that's been building up in the continental crust has just been sitting there. It suddenly all gets oxidized, forming this acid front. But then when the atmosphere stays oxic, you never get that buildup of pyrite ever again. So this is a one-time event. Any more questions? Yeah, Craig, that's pretty cool. I mean, interestingly, I, I should discuss with you um, our revised molecular clock um, sort of dates for organisms that are evolving exactly around that time. Um, and we have some unpublished work on um, when the cyanobacteria acquire the genes that are respond that allow them to sort of deal with, you know, salt environments. Um, mm. sort of, but yeah, we, we can just sort of discuss that at some other top point. I think Aubrey has a question for you. Okay, so the, the Whiting event, I was just basically, so from the Lomagunni part, my whole thing about is the phosphate being brought in by the clay, so it then provides nutrients for the plankton. The question then is, if you have plankton bloom, how does it then affect its surroundings? So if it's growing where the clay particles are, you're going to get an organic rich sediment. But where you don't have the detrital input, so areas where the water is relatively clean, you've got two options. Back at that time, you either get band ion formations or you get carbonates. So we've got our happy plankton. Our happy plankton can do, oxidize, do things like oxidized ferrous iron, whether it's done through the stuff that Casey works on, the photoferrotrophs or cyanobacteria, it's neither here nor there. We've got happy plankton oxidizing iron. Where there's no iron coming up onto the shelf, what I'm saying is they could also fulfill a role by doing things such as precipitating calcium carbonate if there's enough calcium around. So I'm not saying it's directly linked to anything. I'm just saying that by having this extra plankton bloom, it can be manifest into the rock record either via organic rich shales, either as bad ion formations or as carbonates or as micritic carbonates. So that's kind of what I was getting at. So I see Mark is pretending to be Aubrey. All right. I didn't think Aubrey would ask such a mean-spirited question. I know it's joking with you, mate. Um, were you suggesting the bottom? Uh, yeah, how far phosphate gets out? Well, you know, where you've got upwelling. So I'm thinking like with, you know, like with Ekman transport, right? So you've got like the winds coming along. So I've, I'm, I'm imagining that You've got downwelling coming because you've got, you got wind surface water is blowing off shore, right? Downwelling water is coming up. So as the downwelling coming up, and they too can obviously have phosphate, but the plankton at the top are being moved by the surface waters offshore. So how far does phosphate get offshore? Good question, before it gets completely diluted. Not a clue. I, I wouldn't suspect it's going to get super far, but... That, that's a good question, Mark. I, I really don't know how far it gets, but I see it moving offshore. And I also see the plankton moving offshore because we've also done some, some of the work that, you know, I've been involved with, with Sean Crow and that is looking at, and, and Casey's doing this too, looking at when you talk about BIF formation, what happens with the microbes and the iron oxides that they form? Do they sediment together? And some of them must do because with band ion formations, you need a reductant to give you magnetite. 
but there's also work that shows they, they don't necessarily sediment together, which means you can get iron deposition in the plankton being basically moved offshore to other areas where there is no iron. So that's where you can get, to, for example, methanogenesis or something like that, where you don't have that terminal electron acceptor in the form of iron anymore. Yeah, one more question from Ben. Okay, where does the nitrogen come from? So that's a good question. Um, I would assume nitrogen fixation. Yeah, I mean, by then you definitely have cyanobacteria, at least for, from the cyanobacteria perspective, um, nitrogen fixes, because nitrogen fixation evolved kind of quite early within cyanobacteria. So I guess, you know, that's kind of all interacting. Yeah, I, I just, if I can just say one last thing, it's like, for me, it's like, why I gave this talk, when I, as a geobiologist, why I love this type of work is because it integrates everything together. Mm. Right, you have to understand something about the composition of the crust, for example, chromium rich rocks and stuff like that. You talk about plankton blooms, the nutrients they need, how that then relates to the atmosphere, how that then relates once again back to weathering to ocean composition. In other words, you know, when I teach my students geobiology, I very much try and stress the point that they play an integral role with so many things. You have to look at it holistically, at how all these things fit together with microbes kind mm -hmm. of being kind of like the glue that links a lot of these different reservoirs together. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate with this. So, you know, whether it's an aerobic bacteria creating low pH on land, basically then simulate stimulating planting growth in the ocean, which then leads to more organic carbon burial, which then leads to increased respiration in the sediment pile, which leads to things like phosphorites. I mean, it's all linked by different microbes, right? So that's kind of why I think this stuff is really interesting because it, it brings so many different things together. So, you know, people like Trisha and I can talk about the same topic, even though I haven't a clue what she does, <laughs> because it's the, the environment or the setting that we have something in common about, right? Yeah, I'm actually grateful people like you exist because all that clay stuff was quite complicated for me. But so, it, no, it's great. Um, Look, if anyone, has, if anyone has any questions, because I know I, I, I rambled on there, yeah, no. um, just send me an email. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you again, Kurt. I don't think we have any more questions. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'll stop with the record now and um, thanks again. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone.